Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 394, featuring the final installment with the great Chuck Somerville. In this part of the uh, in this part of the interview, we talk about Chips Challenge 2 and the level editor, what was going on with that. Uh, we also talk about a, a little known uh, prototype system, the 3DO, 3DO M2 system, and some of the incredible stuff that uh, never got off the ground or never got released, but it's got uh, Chuck worked on it. It's got some really good uh, insider information on that system, and uh, we let's see what else we talk about. The uh, uh, Michael Jordan Chaos in the Windy City. Uh, we talk about a Sega Genesis title uh, that used uh, polygons in a really interesting way, and then uh, we wrap up though what I think is really the the, the most fun uh, aspect of this whole thing. Uh, Chuck actually worked on the uh, Waterford Crystal LED effects for the. Uh, uh, Times Square ball drop of 2007-2008. Uh, we talk about all the events leading up to that and get a look at behind the scenes at all of his uh, LED tech wizardry stuff. It's really, really cool. I know you're really going to enjoy it. Anyway, we've got a lot to cover here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Chuck Somerville. Were. Oh, I was talking about releasing Chips Challenge 2. Yeah, so... Um... Yeah, so this game was finished for years and sitting in the can and not releasable. And so this mystical creature, um, you know, was released and the, the, the community went crazy. They're like, yay, we can finally play Chips Challenge 2. And, uh, and it came with an integrated editor. So um, one of the things that kept Chips Challenge alive for all those years, by the way, was that the fans had um, reverse engineered the level format for the Microsoft version. And they made their own editors so they could create their own content. And I think it was one of the first examples of games kind of being modded. Um, but not only that, once they understood, once they made the level editors, there were some fans that went so far, since you couldn't buy the Epics version anymore, they started making their own Chips Challenge game engines, they their own Chips Challenge emulators that would emulate the same game mechanics perfectly, uh, both the Microsoft and the Lynx version. So you could buy this thing, you know, you, you didn't have to buy it, it was free. It was called Tile World, which was the original uh, working title of Chips Challenge when it was in development. So you could get Tile World, and you could get all the levels, and you could play it all and not pay anything, and you know, get all the content, and I was totally okay with that. I, You're I don't totally mind. Totally okay with this. Wow. I am because it kept the it kept the franchise alive. It really did. It, it made it made it you know, it made it be the classic that it is, because people kept playing it. So you see that more. I guess it's sort of an homage than a. Yeah. So I I you know and uh, and people who were doing revenue. this work. <laughs> The people who were, were doing this work were contacting me and saying, here's what I'm doing. And I said, yeah, go for it. I mean, I wasn't making any money anyway. So, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> I would much rather the legacy be out there than, you know, than anything else. That seems like a good attitude. Uh, well, let's see what else we have here. I had a couple other, some couple other things uh, from the notes. Uh, you'd mentioned a Michael Jordan game. And I was wondering, is that the in-flight <sighs> game or is that no. something else um so when i started working at ea um one of the first projects i worked on was uh, a project that was in trouble mm -hmm. <laughs> it was the michael jordan um chaos in the windy city chaos and it was in a, the windy city chaos in the windy city was the, was the game title and it was a platform game you know like mario um <laughs> Like, and uh, the storyline is that uh, Michael's uh, basketball teammates have been kidnapped by evil villains, and they're in various warehouses throughout Chicago, and Michael has to go and rescue them. And as he goes through his warehouses, going you know up and down platforms, uh, he's got these basketballs that have magical powers, like you know they throw flame, or they make ice on the floor, or they boomerang, or... All these strange things that, that the uh, basketballs could do. And it was actually kind of an interesting game. Uh, it was designed by uh, Amy Hennig, 
um, who is now a super famous game designer. But it was like one of her first game designs, so I'm proud to have worked on one of her first game, game designs. And uh, yeah, so that was Michael Jordan, Chaos in the Wind City. Chaos uh, in the Windy City. Yeah, so um, Don, Don Traeger, the project manager on that, um, went out to see Michael Jordan, who was in spring training at baseball at the time, because oh, wow. he, he, he had a short sprint of doing baseball. And he got us all signed to baseballs. So I have a Michael Jordan signed baseball, baseball from his short short term for the short period he was actually a professional baseball player. That's pretty unique collectible. Mm-hmm. Let's see what else. Uh, you, I wanted to talk a little bit about this system. You know, you seem to have had a lot of experience with uh, somewhat obscure systems, I guess we could say. I mean, uh, the, the, the links, and we, I noticed uh, you did some games for the 3DO, or at least some, some projects for that system, right? <clears throat> Right, so um, boy, talk about an obscure system. So when I went to go I've work got for three DO here somewhere, I don't know. Uh, you don't have this. You don't have this one. I, don't I guarantee have this you. One. <laughs> no, you don't have this one. Um, so this was called the M two. Um, when I went to work for three DO um, after leaving Electronic Arts, they were putting together a new piece of hardware called the M two, and the, the original hardware, the Opera was you know kind of old and and worn out so they were they decided they were going to build a whole new platform and it had a it had a really high power triangle engine in it um so and it was based around the power pc mm-hmm. and they um so they were working on various games for it and one of their flagship games for it was called IMSA Racing, uh, like the International Motorsports Association Racing. And uh, I was put on that team. And uh, now the reason you've never heard about this is because the hardware was never released. Um, they, we got to the end of the project, we finished the game, and I guess they had problems getting a favor, favorable deal in manufacturing or something like that. And they canned the project, it was never released. And uh, 3DO eventually went on just to become a game publisher. Uh, but it was their last attempt to make hardware. And, um, you know, there was sort of some bitterness there. I, I really wasn't bitter about the game never being released and the hardware never being released. Because while I was at 3DO, I got to work with some of the greatest people in the industry. I was working with Ed Rotberg, you know, of Atari fame. I was working with Bill Budge. I was working with... Um, Pinball Construction Center. Uh, yeah, I just, it was an amazing time. I got, you know, to work on the bleeding edge of stuff. And, you know, I, I really enjoyed the time. And I, I, philo- philosophically, I just said, I just really enjoyed this period of my life and the technology as opposed to just being disappointed that it didn't come out. Um, but that was the M2. Um, it like it was pretty impressive hardware. It was. Um, yeah. Yeah, I guess too bad it didn't come out. Um, but the work I did on it, I did all the camera work. So all the stuff for automating the cameras, moving through, you know, watching the, the race go on and uh, the, all the replay camera work, and, you know, the fixed cameras and flying cameras and all that camera work. Uh, that was stuff that I did. But no, you know, but nobody got to see it. Uh, of course, I also had to, optim- I had to optimize the rendering. So, um, you know, that was part of the camera work was... Uh, from every scene, analyzing what was visible and what was not visible, and putting it into a, a pre-built calling list. That's a shame that it's nowhere yeah. to be found. Maybe that you think it'll resurface in some kind of emulator type. I doubt it. Archive or something. Uh, oh. It's one of those one of those lost technologies. Let's see. I think I might have skipped a game by accident here. Uh, F eleven seven Night Storm. Uh, F one seventeen night storm, yeah, Nightstorm something like that for the Genesis. For the Genesis, yeah. Um, so uh, that was uh, the second project I worked on at EA. Uh, we're working with Chris Ebert, and we were um, EA had developed a, a polygon engine for the Genesis, which was really kind of interesting because the Genesis was not a polygon machine; it was a character based machine. Mm-hmm. Um, but they had uh, built this polygon engine that would allocate characters from the character set on the fly to draw lines across um, the space. 
and they actually were doing polygon rendering, um, you know, on a, on a character-only screen, which was really an unusual thing. Uh, and this um, this flight game, which was you know this um, airplane uh, attack game, um, Chris and I worked on. And um, I mean, I mention it because it's a title that I worked on, and it was a, it was an interesting technology. But other than that. I'd say it was actually kind of unremarkable. <laughs> yeah, I noticed it kind of caught some flack on the some of the reviews. I guess. Were... I mean, do you remember getting panned by critics or something? What was the? Yeah, I I didn't read the reviews on it. So if it was it was panned, uh, okay, it, it maybe it deserved it. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I just I saw one review there that was kind of net nasty, but uh, I know what. Okay, might have just been a random person. <laughs> Or, or maybe the game wasn't any good, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. <laughs> all right, well, let's see. Uh, I guess that's about all the game stuff I have. Uh, the rest of the questions were about uh, the Halloween and Hell's Breath. Kind of, you kind of touched on that a little bit already. Yeah. Uh, you, I'm sure you wanted to talk a little bit about the uh, the LED stuff and the time. I'm kind of curious about this Times Square ball. I mean, that sounds like a really big well, deal. Let me, let me show you a couple quick things on Halloween that you you may have seen in the videos, but I'm going to have a couple quick props here I want to show you, and then uh, then we can talk about the LED ball. So there's a video on my, my YouTube channel. If you, if you search for Chuck Somerville Halloween, um, you can find it. There's one where there is a, an alien that teleports candy down for the kids. And uh, so this is the prop that I built. Um and I've got like a, a stuffed um, snake there, I think, tied around it. But this was the prop that um, dispensed the candy. And the candy was actually hidden inside this pipe here. And there was a servo mechanism to drop it. So this would lower down and uh, reveal the candy. And there's a hole in the backside for loading it. This guy here was the, the head of the giant eight-foot robot that I built. Um, this is actually made out of, of cardboard and balsa wood. <laughs> it looks as much more solid looking than it actually is. So that was a couple of the, if, you, if you've seen the videos, there's a couple of the, the props that I was able to save from those Halloween shows. Well, the kids in your neighborhood must go crazy to <laughs> go check uh, out your I, place. I, huh? I am a well-known destination. <laughs> um, you got kids coming talk in from about... other towns or? No, no, I'm just, I, I, I don't advertise it at all because I, when we did Hell's Breath, you know, we, we promoted it and we had, you know, like five or 600 people in a night and we had to have, you know, the police would show up and we had to have lines and crowd control and all that. Wow. And I do not, I, I don't want to do that to my neighborhood. So I don't pr promote it. So there are, you know, maybe a couple hundred people that know to come and see this thing, but I, I do it for the fun of it for the kids. Mm -hmm. But we can talk about LEDs for a bit. You got a big um, kick out of the one you had with the, the dragon bro blowing fire from under the garage. And... Oh yeah, yeah, the the dragon. So that yeah. was this year. That was a good one. Yeah, that was um, a good one. Yeah. Um, so we can talk about LEDs a bit. So after I left the game industry, um, um, actually, it's an interesting segue from Halloween into LED because we were doing Hell's Breath and we had these uh, Jacob's ladders. And the Jacob's ladders, um, they were you know, about five feet tall in plastic tubes. I have tubes. to admit, I'm not sure what a Jacob's ladder is. Okay, <laughs> let me tell you what a Jacob's ladder is. Yeah. You've seen in old-time movies these things where it looks like there's a spark that goes between two wires, and the, the spark climbs up in the oh, okay. air, and then another spark goes up like that. That's a Jacob's ladder. And um, they're actually incredibly easy to make, uh, but they're incredibly dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they sound a little dangerous. Yeah. Um, so what a Jacob's Ladder is, is you take a high-voltage transformer, like from a neon sign, and you just hook it straight up to two pieces of wire that are close to each other and get far, farther apart, you know, close together at the bottom and get farther apart as they go up. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, it turns out that air is actually a conductor of electricity, although not a really great one. Um so if you get enough voltage and they're close enough together and there's a there's not and there's not a lot of air and lot, not a lot of space air for the electricity to go through that it'll conduct through and you get a spark and that's what lightning is mm -hmm. and then the um, um, 
because of the the effect of, of what it does to the air, it actually increases the conductivity um, slightly above where the spark is, and then it will grow up, and it, it will, will go up. So that's how those things work. So during one of our shows, was, these were encased in an acrylic tube to protect them from the, the public so that you, they couldn't get hurt. Um, and during one of the shows, one of the tubes um, caught on fire. <laughs> And uh, at the end of the show, we put it out, and I took the tube out. I'm telling you this story because it's, it's interesting how it leads to the LEDs. Um, so um, at the end, during cleanup, I was looking at this tube, and I said, "This, you know, I paid a lot of money for this tube. What kind of prop can I build out of it? And I envisioned this tube hanging down um, point above the Frankenstein's table, pointing at the monster, um, doing pulses of energy flying down it with LEDs around the outside edge. And we had already been building props with LEDs for the lab by this time. So I built this prop, and it took me a couple months. It was all hand, it was all hand wired, and I actually uh, built a 6502 computer, 6502 computer that fit inside the tube that I, I hand designed the computer, and I hand wire wrapped it. So wire wrap is a technique where you have these sockets with pins on them, and you have a special tool, and you, you put the wire down over top of the pin, and you twist it, and it attaches the wire. It's really detailed work. But I built this computer, put it inside the, the tube. The tube was, you know, about three inches of diameter. And uh, by this time, my partner, Fuzzy, was um, working in Montana, um, and he was working in the video, in the video slot machine industry. So he said, hey, that's really cool. Let's build big ones because he always likes to outdo me. So we ended up building – I got a picture of one of them here. This thing here, I don't know if the whole thing is in, in view here. So this thing is about five feet tall, and it's about a foot in diameter. And uh, this was Fuzzy's, um, Fuzzy's way of outdoing me was to design and build this thing. And uh, so anyway, we, um, we sent this thing. Uh, so he showed it off. To, oh, let me, let me tell you about the plan. The plan was we would build about four or five of these. We would start a company, build about four or five of these, and um, pay for, to build them. And then we would bankrupt the company, and we would take it off as a business loss, and it would cost less to build them that way. So that was the plan. <laughs> uh, that's not how no, things worked out. It's above my pay grade, that kind of plan. <laughs> <laughs> so, so instead, um, so he was, Fussy started showing them off to his friends that were in the gaming industry, and they said, those are really pretty. I bet we could sell them to casinos. <laughs> so um, we made like 20 more and uh, sell, sold them, and then there, were, um, there was this uh, company that was selling slot machines into the California gaming market, Indian gaming market, mm -hmm. and they wanted... Um, they wanted a jackpot progressive signs um, for their their progressive jackpot banks, but they couldn't buy them from the companies that were making them because nobody wanted to risk their gaming license with the gray market Indian stuff. Mm -hmm. So they they noted that we could put text on our tower, and they said, hey, could you make a jackpot progressive sign for us that has text and numbers on it? And we said, yeah, if you'll pay us, we'll do anything you want. <laughs> <laughs> we're an engineering firm. Yeah. And um, so, so we started making stuff full time. You know that became our new job. And that's LED effects. And um, this was our this was our logo here. This guy. Oh, let me turn around. That was our logo. A little LED guy. And we have been, ended up doing a bunch of projects. We made uh, this um, st this lift status sign for um, Squaw Valley. We made this traffic sign for um, some um, some stadium up in Seattle. I forget who those guys were. <laughs> so I guess you found and, out a ways uh, to make it to make this stuff easier as you went along, right? Or was it still well, just yeah, we, hand, we learned all everything we by learned, hand? Well, we learned the technology, yeah. but you know, I was already essentially an embedded systems programmer mm -hmm. because that's what you're really doing when you're making video when you're making video game stuff. You're an embedded systems programmer. So that's what I specialized in, embedded systems programming, you know, writing code for the chips that went inside. And Fuzzy ran the business. And um, so at one point, um, 
the we got contacted by Phillips Lighting, and uh, they wanted us to do the Times Square Ball. And I have here in my hand a module from the first time we built the Times Square Ball. So this is this is one of the original modules. Bit of, bit of history there. Yeah, uh, it it has some. A uh, point here um, for mounting the Waterford crystal that goes on it. Actually, I think four of them went on this. And uh, so we built that. Um, uh, we built the lighting modules for it and, um, you know, the the, con the control system for it. And uh, the mechanical work, the, the steel work for it was done by a welding company somewhere on the East Coast. And they shipped all those parts out to California. We mounted our lighting modules in it, and they were really bright. Um, and then when we were finally ready to test it out, we rolled it out into the parking lot, and we lit it up, and everybody was cheering, and there's this bright light in the parking lot. And then we found out the next day, because Fuzzy was on his way home in an airplane, and he was flying over, mm -hmm. and he looked down, and he saw this bright light, and it wasn't a bright light that he knew what it, what, where it was coming from or what it was until he finally figured out, oh, they must have brought the ball out and put it in the parking lot so he saw it from the plane wow. <laughs> while, while we had it out you know partying in the parking lot and uh so that was really quite exciting so were you, were you there to watch it drop and, i'm sure and we ship it off to, Cal to um to new york yeah so we sent it off to new york and uh they wanted a representative from the company to be there on this was the 2007 2008 ball drop and um uh, so I was sent along with my family, and we got to be a VIP uh, at the VIP party at the Waterford Crystal uh, party at the Doubletree, which is right in smack in the middle of Times Square. So while everybody else is out freezing and their little corrals on the street, we're inside with our hors d'oeuvres and our live band and our, our open bar, and uh, they reserved a corral for us outside, you know, and at 1130, we all went out. And we got in the corral, and we looked up, and we saw the ball come down, and we sang old Lang Syne and all that stuff. And then we went back into our party. <laughs> it was an amazing experience. That's how you do it. Right. <laughs> And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back next week with a new interview series. Oh, with a little guy. Let's see, what's his name? Really obscure. Uh, <laughs> Leonard Bajarski. Yeah, he's on. going to be on the Matt Chat Show. Uh, hopefully next week. Uh, we'll see. That's what I'm uh, gearing up for anyway. Uh, so thank you, Lars, for making that possible. And thank everyone else uh, for funding this show, keeping these episodes in production. Uh, keeping interviews like uh, uh, this one with Chuck Somerville in the pipeline on YouTube, free for all. Uh, it's all uh, because of you guys and your support. So I want to thank you, thank you, thank you very, very much from the very rock bottom, deepest dank cellar, tomb, <laughs> crypt of my heart. Thank you for supporting the show. I uh, also want to welcome a couple of new rats to the cellars here at Matt, in the Matt Cave. <laughs> Can a cave have a cellar? Why not? Uh, TJ, Jake, and Simo. And I also want to talk about some uh, older rats that leveled up recently. Antonio, Chris, Micah, Omicron, Out of Memory, Torsten, David, Higher Ground Gaming, and Tomas. I uh, also want to mention that I've got some top secret stuff here <laughs> uh, going on behind the scenes. I'm working with one of the uh, my best friends, of the, or the best friends of the show, I guess, if not personal friends, dare I say. Uh, I won't tell you his name because he wants to be uh, anonymous. He values his privacy, but he's working on some fantastic designs uh, for some uh, special prizes that I want to start giving out to the uh, longtime uh, supporters of the show. It's uh, just really, really incredible stuff. I mean, I wish I could share these uh, prototypes with you, but I want to wait until you know it's all finalized. But uh, let's just put it this way. If you, if you supported the show, you're really going to like these. You're going to be glad. Uh, if you're still, for whatever reason, uh, not supporting the show and, and watching these episodes, uh, you know, <laughs> you probably want to get on that quickly because you are going to want these prizes for sure. All right, let's see. Uh, what about that news for the Met Cave?
Okay, got a lot of news here. Uh, first up is some stuff from good old Stig, Matt Chat reporter. Uh, he's the one who's written about the first gameplay footage available and the story details for a game called, uh, let's see, Plot of the Druid by Adventure for Life Studio. This is a good old point and click fantasy adventure series about a young druid apprentice who gets caught cheating on his exam. Has to redeem himself with the help of a female thief and a former mercenary. Anyway, I think what's really going to sell this are the graphics. Check out that art style. Very 90s, and I mean that in the best possible way, as if there could be any other way. Uh, the game, though, supposedly has these uh, unusual interaction mechanics. So instead of the usual uh, two or three possible actions you can exert on an item, uh, you get up to eight. Uh, so it sounds really uh, sophisticated. Uh, keeping an eye, we'll keep an eye on that. Uh, that is Plot of the Druid. Uh, Stig also wrote in about this game, Mind the Vikings. This is a an early access trailer. This is a land where you can build a village full of very silly Vikings, each with their own weird and quirky traits. Uh, you had me at Vikings. <laughs> I love Vikings. Uh, probably wouldn't have liked them so much if I was in, oh, I don't know, Britain back in the day. But uh, anyway, now they're cool. Uh, this game kind of reminds me of the Settlers, uh, maybe something like Towns or Banished. I've got a good feeling about it. It looks like the sort of thing I could probably sink about 100 hours into and still uh, not be bored. Uh, so anyway, I'll keep an eye on this Mind the Vikings. And then Lars uh, wrote in about a couple, actually he wrote in with quite a few items. Uh, let's see what we can do with these. Uh, first up is the Everything You Need to Know About Dark Souls Remastered. Uh, this little... Uh, update on this. They got a password matchmaking system from Dark Souls 3 being implemented in this uh, remaster. Uh, this time you up to six players can be in the same online instance and that goes across the board there. And uh, better still, the first this is the first time the game will use dedicated servers rather than peer-to-peer, -peer, which should make summoning and invading <laughs> much smoother. So uh, good news there. Sounds like all great stuff for that remaster. Uh, Lars also wrote in about the Pillars of Eternity 2 Year in Review post. This is up on FIG. Uh, they got about seven minutes of video there. Uh, you can see the milestones they've reached, and they've also included some uh, pretty fun bloopers. A lot of humor there, but I'm kind of excited about the gameplay refinements they're showing here. Uh, it's a little, I won't go into it. You can watch the video for that, but I'm really, I'm really enjoying this. Uh, uh, I don't know if uh, enjoying is the right word. Excited, there we go. Excited about about the stuff they're doing to the engine there, and uh, it looks like they got some really good ideas. So anyway, I'm really curious to see what your opinions are on it. So go check out that video and get back to me on uh, <laughs> if you like where they're going with it. Uh, it looks like to me they got some great ideas. And then finally, uh, last but not least, is the Copper Dreams gameplay video alpha. Uh, this is a game. Uh, that you might, you might, you probably remember me interviewing Joe and Hannah about serpents in the staglands, and I know I've mentioned this Copper Dreams project uh, many times here on Mad Chat, uh, but anyway, you can tell from this video they're really making major headway with this. Uh, they're doing some really interesting stuff with step-by-step uh, -step action visualization within turns, impactful damage and resources, uh, accessible environments, movement, and tools. And again, this, it's a lot easier just to watch the video than for me to sit here and try to explain all this. But anyway, i got to say, this is really looking good. Uh, I mean, I was impressed uh, from the earlier videos, but this one just kind of blowing me away. <laughs> I am just really excited to play this one, uh, Copper Dreams. I hope they will get this uh, out soon. And hopefully I'll be able to get Joe and, and Hannah back on to talk about it uh, when they do launch. But anyway, definitely go check out that video. It's about four minutes long. Uh, I know you're going to like that and get pumped about the game. All right, oh, well, what about that ale of the week? All right, for the, so for this week, I found this sucker. I mean, this thing looks like something straight out of Ash versus the Evil Dead or <laughs> Supernatural or something. I mean, this is one of the most wicked looking bottles I've ever seen. I mean, this is um, totally metal. <laughs> Got this upside down pentagram, some like Tolkien like runes around the, the thing. It's just wicked as all oh, get out. Uh, I mean, I would buy this, uh, buy this just for the artwork. I mean, it's just incredible. Uh, but anyway, it's a it's it's a Surly Brewing Company selection, pentagram, uh, barrel aged, additionally aged in rye whiskey barrels. So it's it's aged in wine barrels. I think that's like the normal pentagram. But then it's 
additionally aged in rye whiskey barrels. <laughs> this is uh, this is aged. Do you feel like you're aged? You know, sometimes I feel like I'm I've been aged in a in a whiskey barrel. <laughs> Let's see. Beware! This arcane seal guards an enigmatic brew that is funky, dark, and sour. If you choose to break the seal, you have been warned. <laughs> Man, I'm actually getting a little nervous about this. Again, they've kind of scared me. Maybe I won't open this and enjoy the succulent beverage within. <laughs> you know, something tells me I'll get up the, uh, the courage to do it. Let's see, 100%... What the hell? Bretonomyces? What the hell is that? You know, I seem to remember that before, have, uh, coming across that before. Uh, some kind of algae or fungus or something. Anyway, dark beer fermented in stainless and aged in used red wine barrels. Wait a minute. Dark beer fermented in stainless and aged... Fermented in <laughs> stainless... <laughs> I think they're missing some words here or something. That doesn't make sense. Uh, this batch of pentagram has been additionally aged in rye whiskey barrels. Now oh, there we go. Brett, a unique yeast strain that produces flavors that would be considered offensive if they were not intentional. <laughs> Brett, uh, I love this. Flavors that would be considered offensive if they were not intended. <laughs> intentional. <laughs> that should be my motto. Uh, flavors of sour cherry, tobacco, oak, and classic Brett barnyard funk. Balanced by dark Munich malt chewiness. Uh, enjoy immediately or age at a cellar temperature for a couple of years. Unleash the pentagram. Well, that is quite the build-up. <laughs> I don't know about you. Uh, I'm excited about this one. So let's get this uh, pentagram additionally aged in rye whiskey barrels. I guess that's the title. Anyway, let's get this sucker open and see what it's all about. All right, so as you can see here, we're kind of dealing with this Maker's Mark uh, sort of plastic resin around the, the top of this thing. So let's see if I've got an appropriate item with which to uh, <laughs> unleash the beast. I felt like you, you need to, you know, kind of intimidate this, this beer a little bit. It's, it's kind of a little cocky. You know, so I thought we'd uh, rip this thing open, the Rambo knife, and, and just see if I can tear into this a little bit. This thing is wicked sharp, so... I got a good feeling it'll be able to cut right through this waxy coating. Then I will apply my Predator bottle opener on it. So yeah, we're making very good progress with this. <laughs> Let's see if it's if I can get this bottle opener around it. I don't think that's good enough. I might actually have to saw into this. No, there we go. Yeah, it's, it's just about open. Hmm. Well, while I'm opening this, why don't you guys tell me a story? Oh, there we go. <laughs> oh, I thought I had it. You know, I'm just not very good with these waxy coatings. There we go. <laughs> All right, we got her open. Woo! <laughs> Oh, I don't think I should have done that. Maybe I should kind of... Whew, yeah, you you can definitely smell something funky about this one. I'm even a little bit uh, congested here, but... You know what it kind of smells like? Uh, it smells like that uh, gingery kombucha stuff, if you've ever had that. I'm kind of warming up to this. It's kind of an apple cider vinegar-like aroma to it. Anyway, let me get this in the, in the, in the, in the horn here, and I'll tell you what it's like. All right, so it's a little bit more manageable here in this rather excellent drinking horn. You know, it still smells a lot to me like a... Yeah, it might like a kombucha, but I, I could definitely smell some of that uh, bourbon-y uh, flavor, I guess, from the whiskey barrel. I don't really taste anything that reminds me, or uh, smell anything that reminds me of wine. It's more of that kind of a citrusy bourbony like aroma to it. Very, uh, very appetizing. I think the fumes kind of concentrated too much in that, <laughs> in the bottle. But in a glass or a horn or something with a wider rim on it, I think you would actually enjoy that aroma. Uh, but anyway, let's give it a taste here. Mm. 
Oh. Ah, <laughs> oh, guys. <laughs> oh. Mm. Oh. Let's try that again. <laughs> Oh, ah, man, that will, that'll get your attention. Let me tell you, it's a, man, I don't know how to even begin describing this thing. It's, it's definitely sour, kind of like an apple cider, uh, maybe with a little hint of a, uh, what is it, like a grapefruit, like uh, really acidic grapefruit juice. Um, a little bit of a chocolatey finish on that, but man, this is, oh, oh, man, I'm going to try this one more time. I'll try it very slowly this time, very mindfully. Yeah, this one's, it's kind of hard to get this down, to be honest with you. It's extremely pungent. It, uh... Uh, it's kind of this burst of like a sour, uh, maybe like a wine taste. I don't really drink a lot of wine, but I guess uh, I guess that's what I'm tasting there. Um, kind of citrusy and grapefruity again. Uh, I'm not really tasting too much of a bourbon. You kind of smell the bourbon. Uh, it's not really in the taste, though. It's more like that sort of sour kombucha-like uh, flavor uh, with a bit of uh, uh, something I can't quite place there. Uh, but there's just some really unusual flavors in this. I'm going to try this one more time. You know, I'm starting to kind of warm up to this one. It's uh, just extremely com uh, complex. Uh, the flavors, it's almost like that everlasting gobstopper, <laughs> everlasting gobstopper like candy uh, from the movie, right? It just keeps changing and morphing. You know, now I'm tasting like a blueberry. Uh, flavor, if you can believe that, you know, how do we get from <laughs> like a like a apple sour uh, apple cider kind of sour grapefruit taste to something like more like a blueberries and raisins? I mean, this is this is crazy. I'm gonna try this uh, one more time. Yeah, now I'm definitely starting to warm up to it now. Uh, it, you, uh, the first couple of sips or a gulp <laughs> really throws you for a loop. You don't know what, what the heck you're drinking. You know, is this even safe? Uh, then after a couple of, uh, and I guess after you kind of get used to it a little bit, it, it starts to uh, come out more. It's, it's definitely kind of a citrusy grapefruit. Um, what else is in there? Maybe just a little bit of that bourbon. Uh, but really what I taste is that citrusy, sour flavor. Uh, you really smell, though, the, that bourbon, uh, the bourbon barrels, uh, more than you taste it. Uh, anyway, I'm not going to say this is delicious. Uh, it's, it's certainly interesting. If you are looking for something that's uh, just <laughs> really far out, and uh, all your friends will be like, what the hell is that, you know? <laughs> I'd say definitely go for this. Uh, if you are a little bit more tame in your taste and you don't like uh, something wild and weird, <laughs> you probably want to avoid this one. Uh, but, you know, I'm going to give it one more taste here. <sighs> yeah, I just, <laughs> you know, I don't even know if I would know this was ale. Uh, if, I, if I didn't know, if I didn't have the bottle or anything, I just think, what is this? Some kind of, a, you know, weird concoction you've uh, <laughs> boiled up in a cauldron somewhere. Uh, it's going to be kind of hard for me to, to judge this one, uh, just because it is so sort of weird. But uh, I guess I would go maybe, you know, maybe four out of five. I'm, I'd say five out of five if you're just looking for something crazy. Uh, if you just want something that, just based on whether it, the taste, though, it's, it's kind of more like a three or four out of five for me. You know, it's very subjective. But anyway, it's definitely interesting. Uh, so if you're looking for something <laughs> really wild and crazy, uh, check out the uh, Surly Brewing Company Pentagram, and this one is uh, additionally aged in rye whiskey barrels. So uh, it's, it's almost above my pay grade being able to evaluate this one. Just a lot of stuff going on, lots of uh, flavors, some really weird shit. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> Must be the evil influence of the bottle making me cuss. Uh, anyway, uh, let's, just, let's go ahead and go uh, four out of five drinking horns on this. 
a pentagram. Uh, go ahead and check it out. I'd be curious to see <laughs> what you think about it. Uh, but you probably don't want to uh, sniff right out of the bottle or take a big uh, gulp right off the bat. All right, so let's finish this up with a quotation. And I was looking up for quotes by Michael Jordan, because we talked a little bit about that <laughs> chaos in the Windy City. And uh, that game was, you know, weirdly fun. I mean, I was just wanted to play a little bit for the video, but I kind of got into that and wasted quite a bit of time playing it. Uh, I don't know what it is, but it's actually better than it might look. Uh, anyway, here's the quotation by Michael Jordan. He says, I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game-winning shot and missed. I've failed over and over again in my life. And that is why I succeed. So ponder on that and see you guys next week. But I'm a competitive man, Crichton. Always have been. That's what makes me what I am. We're all perfectly well aware of what you are, sir.